All right, we're going to get started today. Thank you all for being here. My name is Allison. I am on the student board for the Critical Issues Symposium this year, and I have the pleasure of announcing our next speaker. Robert started studying drums at the age of 10, starting a band with his twin brother, Richard, who plays the bass. They had a soundproof studio built by their father, Charles Shipley, who was a recording engineer. Robert attended Chicago Vocational High School, majoring in music. After two years of college, he started touring the world with blues bands and a multitude of Grammy Award winning artists. He spent 20 years on the road performing in every venue from Carnegie Hall to Madison Square Garden. Robert then moved to Las Vegas to pursue a more stable life in the Vegas showrooms and to share with kids his passions for drumming. Robert Shipley is currently an assistant professor and the director of jazz studies here at Hope College, a tenure track physician who proudly accepted July 1st, 2021. He's the author of two drum method books titled The Art of the Commercial Drumming and The Complete Drum Methods for the Well-Rounded Drummer. Please join me in welcoming our very own Robert Shipley. the most precious gift anyone can give, so I don't take this for granted. I really appreciate you giving me your time and showing up. That's awesome. Um, I'm, as she said, I'm Professor Robert Shipley, Assistant Professor and Director of Jazz Studies. Other than God and family, music has always been the most important thing in my life. I have traveled the world performing, and I have seen how passion for music can not only unite people of all races, but heal the mind, body, and soul. I have learned that when you give yourself unconditionally to music and let it guide you, it becomes a spiritual journey. I am proud and honored to represent the Hope College Arts Department today. I hope to present my diverse perspectives in the arts through my life story as a professional drummer. I will take you on a journey of my life experiences and how it tells my truth through drums and music. So I'm going to show you some videos that are on YouTube. I sliced them up, shortened them, so they're just going to be little clips. But if you want to see them in a, the full version or if you want to see other artists, because there's a lot out there, you can just simply search YouTube, Robert Shipley on drums, okay? So I'm going to go through, I don't know, about eight small clips of artists that I perform with all over the world. Uh, and then after that, I'll kind of break it down for you and just kind of show how it all unfolds, how it happened, how my passion for music and my formative years developed and how I became a professional drummer. Okay, so first up, uh, uh, 1982, this is one of the first groups that I started touring with. I'm, I'm from Chicago and blues is very big in Chicago. Uh, 1982, about 23 years old. Uh, please enjoy Mighty Joe Young at the Chicago Fest. Please sit together and welcome to the set, Mr. Mighty Joe Young! <laughs>
back there with my cowboy hat on. I moved to New Orleans um, after touring with Mighty Joe Young. Uh, we were on the bill with Clarence Gatemouth Brown and his drummer, Ricky Sebastian, and I became friends. Um, and anyway, he invited me to go down and sub for him and take his, well, take his place with Clarence Gatemouth Brown. He says, hey, they got some touring opportunities. They're about to do an album. Uh, this is a year later, 1983. I'm 24 years old, touring with Clarence Gatemouth Brown. Ladies and gentlemen, we have another tune we'd like to do for you. I wrote 1971 and recorded it over in Paris, France, simply because it was happening then and it's happening now to all of us. And this tune is called Dollar Got the Blues and Getting Lower Every Day. No lie. <laughs> recorded uh, One More Mile. It won a Grammy for Best Blues Album that year, 1984. Okay, okay so um, I toured with, like I said, I toured with Gate Mouth. We went down the West Coast, ended our tour in San Diego, and uh, I, I quit the band. I said, hey, I want to hang out in LA and see what I can make happen. It took about six months of just networking, and uh, sent me in all over the place doing whatever I could do. And I feel very fortunate because six months wasn't a long time for me to land my first uh, sort of big gig. And that was touring with Natalie Cole. So I was with her from 83 to 89. And this is a clip of us doing something on The Tonight Show. <laughs>
So I toured with her uh, for six years. Um, this isn't exactly in order, but I'll, I'll tell you uh, in order how everything happened. So now this was uh, one of my first gigs with Shaka Khan, and we were in Mount Fuji, the jazz festival in Japan. So now this is an HBO special. Uh, Sinbad hosted some Soul Fest HBO specials, and Shaka Khan was on it, and she featured me. So this is a drum solo I did, uh, she, and she featured me on it in Jamaica. Robert Shipley. <laughs> uh, I toured with the OJs for 12 years, and they were also on a, a Sinbad HBO special. So this was in St. Martin. If y'all remember the 
LA, I had the opportunity to play on a set of some TV shows, and this is a clip of me performing with the legendary jazz vocalist Eartha Kitt on The Nanny. <laughs> Super recording artists Eric Benet and Tamia singing Spend My Life with You. after 20, 20 plus 20 years of touring, I decided to get off the road. I got called uh, to do a residency gig in Vegas. And uh, this is one of the premier showroom bands uh, in Las Vegas, Santa Fe. They featured me as well, so this is a 
clip of Santa Fe in Las Vegas. <laughs> to shop for this band, the Joneses, and it came out really, really well. And I wound up working with them. I think out of this video, we got a three-year contract at the Stratosphere Casino, six nights a week, and I worked a lot more with them. But anyway, please enjoy the Joneses. side of Chicago and just kind of unfold how my career came about, my formative years, and explain the whole process. Uh, but before I do that, I must acknowledge some people that really helped me put this all together. Uh, Zachary Adams helped put this slide pres presentation together. Give him a hand, please. Thank you so much, Zachary. And my assistant, Luke Gavin, uh, is helping me out here on the sound. Running the slides. Uh, he's one of my drum students. 
he just uh, got appointed as one of the drummers for the chapel, one of the worship teams, right? Yeah. So give him a round of applause. So now let me just tell you about my story. Uh, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. This is my home. Well, this is what it looks like now. Uh, but 50 years ago when we had a deal, it didn't look like this. Anyway, next. Uh, so this is my family now. My daughter, uh, Courtney, and her newborn, Noel, uh, they live in LA. My daughter, uh, Roshan, and her daughters, uh, they live in Chicago. My lovely wife, my queen, my rock, <laughs> Shirley, and my son and his beautiful family. They live in Tennessee. Thanks. Then this is my family. Uh, my sister, upper left, Evelyn. Middle top is uh, Charles, my brother, Charles Shipley Jr. Then my dad, Charles Shipley. My twin brother, Richard Shipley, my mom, and lower left is me. That's my dad, he was a recording engineer. He afforded my twin brother and I the opportunity to have a soundproof studio in our basement. He took us all over town. Uh, of course, Chicago's a thriving music town. Uh, all over town, uh, I remember being in so many backstages, uh, just meeting uh, celebrities and things and clubs. And, I mean, he just like took us uh, and engulfed us in music. And the opportunity that we had to rehearse uh, every day after school practically. We started in fifth grade. By like sixth or seventh grade, I knew this is what I was gonna be, it was gonna be my career path as a professional drummer, so I was fortunate. And this was my band, my very first band. <laughs> So on the left is the bass player. These are all neighborhood kids. Uh, so the bass player, Paul Jackson, that's me with the drumsticks. Uh, Terry Johnson was our vocalist. She was a freshman in high school. At, oops. at this time, she was a freshman in high school. We played in her high school talent show in first place. And that was pretty cool. We were still in sixth grade. So that's my twin brother on guitar. And of course, the Jackson Five were, were our inspiration. Uh, Michael was about our age. Uh, hopefully, okay, let's see if that video will play. Go. <laughs> We were playing all the hits of the day, uh, Sly and the Family Stones, uh, and so those were my grammar school days. And in high school, I started playing at this church. All four years of high school, I played for Greater Metropolitan Church of, uh, church of Christ Choir. Uh, Reverend Isaac Whitman uh, was an amazing vocalist. Let me play a little something for you to show you what we sounded like, because we did two albums. Shut that down and start it over or something. I can talk us through some stuff. Uh, 
I have some backing tracks to play for you, uh, to play along accompanying me. other um any other sort of inspirations besides Jackson 5 oh so many um it depends on which period I was in my time because there were jazz artists you know jazz drummers and uh but in my early formative years sign of family stones I love Motown um I transferred to this school in my junior year, Chicago Vocational High School, and they had a, the best band program, so that's why I went there. Uh, the All-State Jazz Band, uh, that's me, my junior year, and we won first place in the state competition. The guitarist on the left, Stanley Ellaby, myself, and the first alto saxophonist, Timothy Burton, won solo competition awards. And uh, we were considered called the Pride of Chicago. Uh, four periods of, of music, because it was a vocational school, so I majored in music. Uh, next, this is the marching band for CBS. I thought it was cool afros. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it was the 70s. Uh, okay. And Ike Davis. Did I not tell you guys about him yet? He's the one who took me on the, on the north side and introduced me around town. Uh, yeah, so he says, he called, my good friends call me Ship. Ship, right. Ship, I'm gonna come pick you up, man, and take you now. I was in my second year of college at American Conservatory. And he says, I'm gonna take you and introduce you around town. And uh, he did, the phone started ringing, so that's how my journey started. So I'm gonna play some, uh, a couple of short clips of some tunes and take you on the journey and kind of explain how I, the order I got these gigs and the whole process, okay? Um, Gene Chandler, this is like two years out of college and uh, before I started touring with Mighty Joe Young, Gene Chandler had a hit out and the emotions, of course. So I'll just play a quick medley of their tune.
test data, test data. Check, check. Oh, you know what? You probably have to unmute that because you cut the system down. So on, see it? Unmute it. Technology, I tell you what. <laughs> you know, I'm getting away with not having uh, my band members late because I got back in track. So, um, they don't talk back. So, uh, that's all. Check, 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 check. Okay, what are we trying to do? Is it? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, take my headphones off. Maybe I can hear. Okay. Check, check. Good. Thank you. Uh, okay, Natalie Cole, um, you saw a clip of us on the Tonight Show, but uh, we used to do a segment in the show where they would show her father, Nat King Cole, and the orchestra, and I'm playing along with the track. Well, this is a tune that she remade, that he made it uh, famous, and she remade it. Enjoy. I'll be good. just finishing uh, Natalie Cole and Dionne Warwick at Caesars Palace. We were just finishing a one week run and we were down for about six weeks. So I was on my way, I went back to LA and got a call that Diana Ross was starting at Caesars Palace and was auditioning drummers. So I went back to Vegas. Uh, they had been listening to drummers all day, uh, hadn't settled on anyone and I auditioned and got the gig, and they were starting the next day. So that was an amazing, uh, they had already called in a triple scale uh, recording session drummer, Vinnie Caliuto, and they said, okay, you're starting salary, we're here for two weeks, take your time on the show, um, and then uh, after three days, I started, after the first night, Diana called me in the dressing room, says we love your playing, she laid down the rules, we do this, like this, we don't do that, any questions? And I felt like I wasn't gonna have any more contact with her for the rest of the tour. And sure enough, everything was draped off, Miss Ross, and there was contracts, and I had a retainer, that was, the pay was amazing, the level of production was an upgrade, everything was uh, 
was looking up. So that was an awesome experience. Uh, I had to give an accountant and the whole nine. <laughs> really, anyway. Uh, so here's a little medley. She was starting the US leg of her world tour. And I did that and then moved on to some other things. But here's a little medley of something. I hope you enjoy it. tribute to Billie Holiday called Lady Sings the Blue. And we had a section of the show uh, that we featured tunes from that. And uh, she introduced us and gave us solos. So let me play you, this is that Universal Amphitheater in LA. I hope I have some jazz folks out there. And I'd like to do a little jazz from Lady. Thank you. 
guys doing okay? Are you sure. doing this process, I guess? Yeah. Okay. We're going to do questions, but I just have a couple more. So the Temptations, I toured with them uh, after Diana Ross, and I was only with them maybe six months, but it was a great time. Oh, what a, what a, what a blessing that was. So here's a little medley of some of them. Now, I must say, in tying in the topic of the day, truth, how this works with my approach to drums, music, is the integrity. Playing with the highest level of integrity for me means uh, to appreciate the original form of these songs. You see, I play pretty simple, like the pocket, like the beat that was played on the record. And I think that's the thing that attracted a lot of artists and, and afforded me a lot of work because I wasn't coming in with my ego saying, okay, let me show you how I can make your song better. Um, you know, when a record is purchased and they have millions of selling people buying these records, they want to hear, they appreciate what, what they bought, the original form. Now, especially if you come in a situation like me on a gig, and the artist is singing it just like the record. You know, who am I to come in and butcher their song and start? Now the outro, what they call the outro, then there's some time where you can start creating and adding things and be colorful. But for me, so, so I play really simple because I grew up just loving the song as it is in its original form. And I think the artists really appreciate, you know, my sentiment. Uh, I'm very attention to detail. They have my full attention. And how can I support the rhythm section? It's not about how I sound great, but how the rhythm section sounds great. We accompany the horns, or the horns are accompanying us, and we're supporting, you know, the principal artists up front. So it's all a package deal, and uh, so that's how I tie in the whole topic of truth. And when I was in LA, uh, and I was just starting my career as a tour touring musician, you know, it was a lot of doubt and fear, and my faith got tested a lot. And I saw people, uh, how do you say it, lying on their resume, you know, just uh, exaggerating, putting things in because they want to, oh yeah, I played with this artist and that artist when they really just played along with their records at home. <laughs> and they were saying, yeah, I played with this artist and that artist. Well, I decided I wasn't going to take that route. I was going to stand on my faith and uh, truth. And I would feel better at the end of my journey on to my integrity, and I do. And I look back and it all worked out that God had, you know, my, uh, he had me, uh, he had my back, really, and a successful career was created. So I'm really, really held, uh, appreciative that I held on to my integrity. Now, here's the Temptations, a couple of tones for you.
know, I have more, but I think I'm going to start with the questions now. Allison's got a microphone. Yep, all right. We're going to move into a time of questions. I'm going to be around. All right, we're going to be around with the microphone for anyone who would like to ask Professor Shipley a question. Bass. He started on guitar and then he switched over to bass, but he never really took it to the level I have with uh, playing professionally. But he still plays bass. <laughs> um, why did you decide on playing the drums, like instead of another instrument? Like what? Well. Drums? Uh, my dad played drums, and it was more like a hobby, but he bragged about, oh yeah, he was, he was a great drummer and played a lot of uh, So yeah, I think that was a, a lot of it. And then just him taking me around and seeing live performances and professionals, and when I saw how powerful this instrument can be uh, when it's played on a, a professional stage, I was just infatuated. I was just like, oh. You know, and, and the hardest part for me is playing soft as I'm playing right now. <laughs> I, you know, I practiced this with the track and listened to it, and I wanted it to, to be balanced. Did it sound okay? Yeah, yeah. great. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so that's the hardest thing because when you're playing on those big stages, you know, you, you, you want to play kind of hard. And, uh, you're not doing something pretty hard. <laughs> Thank you. Very wonderful presentation. So, what were some of the yeah? So, other than seeing maybe some of your colleagues lie on their resume or temptations like that, uh, what were some other greatest frustrations you had during your whole career? Oh, so many. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's it's out there. Uh, tours start, tours end. Not everyone had a retainer like Diana Ross did, so that was really cool. Uh, if you don't know, retainers when you're paid when you're off, so it, uh, that was, you know, give you some cushion, some financial security. So a lot of times uh, tours end and you don't know when it's going to come back, or you say, okay, I got three months, six months off, and, and so that's probably how I got so many people on my resume because I was like, okay, see you. I'm going, you know, I'm going over here. I'm going to you know, burn the hands of them or whatever. So uh, that's one of the main challenges. And that's one of the reasons I quit the role because after 23 years, I got the offer to move to Vegas with, and do residencies. And even those did, but they were like three years here, two years there, six days a week. Uh, the Motown Review Show, which, oh, yeah, I got some more slides. I think uh, so that was Chaka. That was, oh, go back. Yeah, that was uh, two summer residencies I did in Monte Carlo, in the south of France. Wow. And all these artists would come set in with us, and that was Stevie uh, sitting in with us at, at the club. But so I spent two summers in France, and I jumped around. I did a lot of gigs. Uh, what else I got? That was Earl Turner, uh, a showroom gig. He had a, a showroom built for him at Harris Casinos in New Orleans. And because of Katrina, it got shut down. So after Hurricane Katrina, uh, we went back. He invited me to play with him there. And that was where we did like three months, one summer, 2015. Uh, this is the Motown Review Show that I did in Las Vegas at Planet Hollywood. It was an afternoon gig. So 5.30 to 6.45, hour and 15 minutes, six nights a week for eight years, I did that. While I was doing uh, lounge gigs, six years, uh, three years here, six nights a week. So I doubled for a year, sometimes some years with no days off, because the off days would be different on the different gigs. But I was doing what I loved, it was constant work, and uh, it was consistent, I was able to be in my bed every night, and after on the road in those hotels and so I, I got a little weary of that and uh, the financial insecurity so Vegas afforded me an opportunity to uh, have uh, stability and to 
consistent work. Anyone else? was neighborhoods. I mean, in the 70s in Chicago, there were so many bands. And <laughs> the funny part is a lot of those bands, people, if you played in, if you were in the neighborhood, you played cowbell or tambourine or something. Yeah, come on, be in a band. You know, more cowbell, right? <laughs> so, so it, you know, it was just fun times. There were bands all over the city. It was just neighborhood people. A lot of people used to come to our basement and we would have our side door unlocked People would just come in, neighbors, people, and to this day, people tell me, oh yeah, I used to come down to your basement and watch you and your friend around and rehearse. You know, it's just like a hang. Kind of huh? Have that kind of Isn't it? Yeah, I still have very dear friends in Chicago that you can remember. Anyone else? Yeah. Would you share a little bit about um, what brought you to Hope College and what this experience like is like for you in this role versus being on tour, being out and about? Yeah, well, you know, I get that question a lot. Why'd you move here from Vegas, you know? <laughs> oh, <college. laughs> um, there was a lot that attracted me to Hope College. The very initial thing, person was Dr. Hugh Lewis, because he was the first person I talked to. And his charm, and he's just a beautiful person music department, the rest of my colleagues, and faculty, and then I visited the campus to interview, and I just fell in love. So, uh, hope is, you know, I just felt like where God wanted me. And in terms of, yeah, uh, I traveled the world, I've lived in major cities, Chicago, Atlanta, LA, New Orleans, Las Vegas for 18 years, two summers in France, I mean, I was pretty content with my career as a performing artist. And so at 56 years old, 2015, I decided to go back to school. I got my degrees and uh, six years at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, uh, UNLV, and got my degrees praying and hoping to land a job like this. And here I am. So God just, just felt right. My dad, when he retired, he moved back home to Florence, Alabama, a small town. And that's where me and my twin brother used to spend our summers. So a small town is, is a part of my history. It just feels right. It's, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. So much I like, I like about it. President Scogin is just <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Right, just give it, just give it. Oh, Um, is there anyone in the music world today that you listen to that you draw in, is inspiration from, or is there someone that you would like to play with in, in today's world? Yeah. Well, in my role now as a director of jazz studies, and it's all about growing the, the helping the Department of Music, jazz specifically, because uh, that's what I was brought here for. That's my interest, so my whole, my whole interest and my goal is all about the students you know, in the Department of Music and, and Jazz. Uh, so artists and playing, uh, you know, I'm almost afraid. Like the six years that I went back to school, I stopped working in Vegas and I was afraid. I went to school every summer. I was afraid to take a break because I thought, you know, somebody would take me away from this path. And uh, I knew this is what I wanted to do. So when I make up my mind to do something, it's, kind of set on it. Uh, and so now I'm making up my mind to be here. <coughs> All this experience and everything is for me to be here with you guys. So. That answer your question? Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. I can just talk to you all. Oh, come on. Let's do it. <laughs> How so often with professional athletes, musicians, actors, they're gone. They're touring. They're moving. How did you balance Work life, family, wife, kids, yeah, that all that. Yeah, that becomes a challenge for a lot of musicians. It didn't so much for me because everyone in my life knew music was first and that this was it. You know, it wasn't like even being 
cold or, you know, forget you, I'm going to be, no, it wasn't like that. It was just like, this is what I do. And um, <coughs> it just seemed to all work out. Yeah, with family and things, because a lot of musicians say, hey, uh, yeah, I'd like to do this, but I need to be stable, and so I'm going to do it. They sacrifice it. It, it's, a, it's a tough journey. It's not easy to be a musician or an artist, you know, but once you commit to it and you just do the things that are necessary to be successful. And I'm, I'm uh, what, again, how am I doing on time? Uh, got a few minutes, right? Yeah. Where is, one second. Uh, Ricky Minor, who is the bass player, musical director, and so he wrote a book titled "No Traffic" or "There's There's No Traffic on the Extra Mile," and it's very motivating to me. And I'm using it as a required material for my FYS students. I hope I see there's some of them here. <laughs> Uh, to get motivation from it, but he talks about his journey. I met Ricky early in life. We were both about 23, 24 years old in Las Vegas, and so he, we were both kind of just getting started. He, he just went leaps and bounds. I mean, like we're all suited for our purpose, of course. Uh, but anyway, he talks about if you want to climb, be a mountain climber, you got to go where the mountains are, you know? And for me, I wanted to be a professional musician touring, so I had to go to LA. And some of the, some of the things are just kind of simple, they just make sense. Like you gotta be, make it easy for people to get you these gigs. So you gotta be where the gigs are. Um, but yeah, you just make the decision. I just made the decision. I don't wanna make it sound simple, it was a lot of work. But I made the decision to prepare myself. God bless me. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, that took me a minute to answer. Anyone else? How did you hear about Hope or first learn about the opportunity here? I saw the post about it, um, that the position was open, and I was just finishing my last semester of grad school at UNLV, so I was shopping around, you know, looking for this type of position. How'd you meet your wife then if you're on the road all the time? <laughs> right, so I had moved to LA, um, I'm sorry, I moved from LA to Atlanta, and that's where she's from. And uh, we were at a, I was playing at a jazz club, and she was there, and she hit on me. Not, not <laughs> that's my version of the story. She's got a whole other version. Like, I came to her. That's, that's a meeting straight out of a movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's like, she's like, she's like, no. Yeah, so, so that was a match made with Catherine. So did she travel with you then, after that? Oh, well, she was actually a flight attendant. So she was used to flying all the time, and I was flying all the time, and so it was no problem. Yeah, she's been all over the country. Tennessee has she been out of the country. We've traveled vacation out of the country. So but she's come with me. But yeah, we did a lot of traveling together. It made it, it, made it easy that she Yeah, I've been to Hawaii probably three times, I think. Once to Maui, and then the next time to Honolulu. Uh, the Big Island once. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you think that you might go back and get your doctorate? <coughs> um, I don't know. I don't, I don't think so, but I wouldn't say no. Yeah. I might, you know, I don't see that in my immediate plan. Yeah, I still do. I mean, you know, it's just, uh, it's, you know, your faith gets tested, and I'm sure we all do, and uh, you just have to hold strong to it. But any specific examples, my uh, faith is tested often, you know, if I'm being honest. Uh, but, you know, being old.
older now, I can look back and that helps strengthen my faith because I look at all the challenges and all that he's brought me through, God has brought me through. So that strengthens my faith to just hold on to my integrity, stay in the moment, don't worry about yesterday, you prepare for tomorrow, but don't live in it because all I have is right now, you know, and, and that, that helps me a lot. You know, don't get me to preach it because <laughs> you don't want that. <laughs> it's a whole other thing. I believe that too. So what else? Anyway, I don't know. I'm happy to speak about the goodness of God. You know. Anyway. Yeah. Is there a particular artist you were the most excited to play with? Okay, I get that question a lot. Who did you enjoy playing with the most? Uh, excited to play with? I was excited to play with artists for different reasons. Diana Ross probably paid me the most. So that. <laughs> Chaka Khan was family. Like she would give us raises without asking for it. So I was excited about that. She was just really nice. Uh, the, o the OJs, I grew up on their music. I loved it. It was all guys. So just traveling up and down the road on those tour buses, it was a lot of fun. You know, different artists for different reasons. Uh, but I tried to learn not to get too personally involved and just keep it professional and just do my job, try to do the best I could for different reasons. Anything else? When you were just starting out, is there any advice that you know now that you would give me now? Um, help others. You know, this is just me being wise and looking back, and because then I didn't know all this stuff, but I look into the eyes of students who are wondering if they're going to make their mark and how how's it going to work out, and you might do things out of fear. Yeah, but you know, I used to be fearful, and now I look back and say, "Wow, God really worked it out for me, and I had a really good career in that, and all those fears were for nothing." You know, uh, so. Just hold on to faith and work hard on your craft and, and be positive, I guess. Trust in the Lord and know that everything's going to be okay. You know, it's tough sometimes. But, yeah. yes. Were there any jobs you turned down for a particular reason? Like because uh, of faith or because of whatever? <laughs> oh, you know, I wasn't ever really good at turning jobs down, but okay, I was always what... working. So, I would just take the next best gig or whatever. Uh -huh. But um, if I committed to something, then I'm in there and I'm not going to leave anyone hanging. Uh, I think that's another reason why I I got called a lot was because I because I had a great work ethic. And if a person called me, if I wasn't able to do it, I wouldn't just say I can't do it and hang up the phone. I'd say, let me find you somebody. Because I was trying to be that one call that they need to make. Just make one call and you're going to be good, you know, like that. If I did have something come up that was a better offer and I was considering taking it, I wouldn't just leave somebody hanging that I committed to. I would find an adequate sub, another drummer, sometimes a better drummer, and I'd say, hey, I can't do this, but here's your name would probably know this great drummer and say, hey, thank you for coming to chair, you know, or they might say, well, I'll find another. But uh, when I went back to school, like I said, I was so fearful of getting sidetracked from my academic journey that I started turning down work. And I had an agent that was that really sad. He wasn't mad or anything, but uh, we, had, we worked together for 12 years and he kept me employed that last lounge act that I showed you. Uh, and so he was kind of sad, when, but they saw me on the gigs backstage uh, during during our breaks, and I have my keyboard and my books, and I'm studying, and they were like, "Wow, look at you, Shipley, you did it! You you know." They saw the journey and how how dedicated I was. Yes, Professor Shipley, do you have another tune for us to take us out? Okay, you want to hear one more? Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. yeah, I got something. Cool. Thank you. Uh, okay. Let's see. Thank 
thank you all for coming again. I really appreciate you showing up for me. It means a lot to me, and it's been my pleasure. And, and thanks to uh, uh, Steve, uh, Stephen Maulo, the Dean of Arts, for inviting me to do this. I was like, wow, yeah. And then I was like, what am I going to do? <laughs> With the help of Zachary and Luke and putting this all together, I, I hope it came out. of that on YouTube. If you check, if you search Robert Shipley on drums, on Oprah Winfrey, I did that song with Chaka, and it was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Any, uh, somebody asked me about some encouraging words or something I would give somebody? Or did I, huh? Oh, so, so, um, <laughs> yeah, I, oh, I answered that, didn't I? Yeah, just hold on to faith. I, I think about Chaka Khan, because she was asked that on a TV show. Hey, Chaka, what are some encouraging words you would tell uh, to up and coming something? And she said something her father told her, that the toilet is the great equalizer. I don't know if I should say that. <laughs> <laughs> because there, there's a lot of deep meaning in that, but what she was trying to say was we are all human. We're all people. And so don't put her up on this pedestal. I don't know what she was going on at the time or what she was going through. But you know, people look at artists like they're superhuman or something like they're, you know, they're just normal people. And uh, yeah, so uh, just be yourself, work hard, you know, have faith in God. Thank you all. <laughs>